kind of important.
box here? Yeah, it's in the box. Okay. All right. I'm going to go on up.
Good morning, Orville Baptist Church. Good morning. It is time for us to begin. Would everybody join with us? And we are going to sing the song called Indescribable. Amazing. 
good singing. The scripture says, who on earth is there that we can compare God to? And the answer is no one. He is indescribable. There are no words really to be able to describe how great he is, although we try over and over and over again, don't we? So maybe the best word is indescribable. Thank you for being here today. It's good to be in God's house. A number of people called this week and said, I'm sick. We're not going to be there. And uh, I just quit answering the phone about halfway through the week. (laughs) So, uh, but I'm glad that you're here. And for those who are sick and uh, are away from us today, we pray and hope that you get feeling better to be back in Orville Baptist Church family soon. All right. Maybe you're here and you've got a word of praise for our God. Uh, this morning, if you just lift your hand, there's Pam, and Dave is right behind you. Um, I, you know, I, I, I've told you in the past, like, I've struggled, you know, with sin and stuff, and I've been repenting, and and I'm still struggling with something, and, and I was sitting watching The Chosen on my tablet, and this, this, like, amazing word, it was like, cleanses us from all. And then there was the emphasis on all. And I knew that God was telling me he cleansed me from all my sin. And it was such a remarkable, wonderful moment. And um, as you know, Alan's struggling. And and we got him home last night. And he had a really good night's sleep. So um, please continue to pray for him and us. And, and praise God he is at work. Amen. Amen. And can I uh, follow that up, Pam, uh, with, uh, with the time when the prayer request went out this week that Alan was heading to the hospital and was going to have emergency surgery. And uh, I pulled into the hospital and uh, looked in front of me, and there was Carl and Valerie's car pulling in. I thought, that's great. They're, they're coming to the hospital. I get to see them as well. They weren't coming to the hospital. They were coming to Pam. And uh, we're going to come and sit with her. And and, uh, it was just, I said, you guys make a pastor's heart proud. So uh, praise God for that. And and then Brother Harry came by and the chaplain came by. We had church service right there in the waiting room. (laughs) So praise God for what he is doing. And so glad that Alan is home. Uh, Thankful that you all did that too. That That was so good. It was so good to be happy. You know, in the midst of a mess. Yes. So thank you all. Yes. All right. Somebody else. Yes. Joe right over here or Ianu? All right. (laughs) Joe's behind you, Dave. I think he's ready. Somebody else is right there. Thank you for my family. All right. She's thankful for her family. Thankful for her family. All right. Thank you, Ianu. I want to thank the, uh, the fam- or, or church family we got here for the cards and their verbal responses and the gifts and so forth for our 22nd wedding anniversary celebration. Thank you all. We love you. <clears throat> all right. Thank you, Joe. Somebody else? Or to praise this morning. Well, I want to say that this, uh, this worship service has been prayed over. We gathered last night, about 15 or so of us, and prayed. Um, and in this room, at this altar, and in places around here. And um, we're just seeking. I told them I really don't know what I want in this prayer time. All I know is I want what Lord's doing to be ours. And so I had passed out on Wednesday, had passed out on Monday to the deacons this this invitation to a spiritual renewal in an individual basis, but um, I also handed out a song uh, that we sing, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior, Hear My Humble Cry, While on Others Thou Art Calling, Do Not Pass Me By. And so If God is doing an extraordinary work in the country at this time, in different places, in different churches, in different universities, in different people, I want to be a part of that. Amen? 
And the way in which we come into his presence and hear his voice is through his word and through prayer. And so uh, we came and we prayed. And so I'm expecting this morning uh, to be able to experience uh, the God who's told us he's with us even yet this morning. Will you join me in a word of prayer? Lord, you truly are indescribable. There is none like you. You are higher than the, than the highest of people in this world. You're greater than any king or president or leader could ever be. You rule and reign over all that you have created. Scripture says that you rule and reign until you make your creation a footstool for you. Everything is under your feet. And so, Lord, we just gladly come and submit and humble ourselves before you today, knowing that you indeed are Lord of all. And so, Lord, we just come to you, thanking you for the opportunity today to come into your house, to gather with your people and to praise your holy name. Father, we ask that uh, during this time that you would join us, that the words that are shared in this that will change hearts would not be from any person, but would from, be from you and you alone. So, Lord, we welcome your Holy Spirit. Thank you that you've promised that you are with us. And so, Lord, we welcome you today, and we honor your holy name. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray these things. Amen. Won't you stand with us as we sing, How Deep is the Father's Love for Us?
for those who do know me, that wasn't a misprint. So. <laughs> <laughs> This old gospel tune, Mansion Over the Hilltop. I'm satisfied with just a cottage below, a little silver and a little gold. But in that city where the rats will shine, I want to go that silver pine. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we will never go. And someday yonder we will never more wander. I walk the three that that appear in school, though often tempted, tormented, and tested, and like the frog. permanent dwelling I know he'll give me a mansion for my home I've got a mountain just up the hills of in that bright land where we will never grow and someday on there we will never more wander but walk the streets that that pure Think me poor, or deserted, or lonely. I'm not discouraged. I'm heaven bound. I'm just a pilgrim in search of a city. I want a mansion, a heart without crown. I've got a mansion just over the hills of in that bright land. We sing Word of God Speak.
Thank you so much, praise team, and thank you, Gary Galbraith, or Gary Gable. Got another Gary that I know. Gary uh, has his family here. He's got his dad with him and, and a sister and I think maybe a niece or nephew there. And We're so glad that you're here and supporting of Gary. And maybe you don't know, but I believe God's doing a work in Gary's life. He hasn't sang in front of people in over 20 years. And he just picked up. He just re-picked up the piano about three months ago. He said it was amazing how it came back to me so quick. And, and so praise the Lord for that. We have partnered, or I have partnered with the drama team this year to be able to share the Easter story. And this morning, we're going to have um, Simon Peter uh, to uh, give a dramatic presentation. And so if you would give your attention to him this morning as he comes. first called me to follow him. I left every, everything I had and became one of the first to become one of his disciples. I sat at his feet as he taught us in parables and showed us the way to the Father. I was there at the Sermon on the Mount. I helped serve when Jesus performed the miracle of feeding the 5,000 with only five loaves of bread and two fish. I had seen him heal the sick, give sight to the blind, even raise the dead. So when Jesus asked us disciples, who do you believe that I am? I said something that I had never put into words before, but even as I answered, I do with absolute conviction that it was the simple truth. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus looked at me, long look, and said, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, 
but my Father who is in heaven. And then Jesus, the Son of the living God, the Messiah, the anointed one, the Christ, said to me, and you are Peter, which means rock. And I determined right then and there that from now on, I would be as firm and as solid as a rock, never wavering in my faith, and boldly proclaiming Jesus as the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. It wasn't long afterward that Jesus began to speak of suffering much at the hands of the religious leaders. Even that he would be killed, led as a lamb to the slaughter. But he was the Son of God, and, and I had my sword. And, and I knew that with me at his side, that was an outcome we could avoid. I pulled Jesus aside, and I brashly began to rebuke him. Far be it from thee, Lord, this shall never happen to you. And Jesus turned to me, and with the strongest rebuke, said, Get thee behind me, Satan, for you're a hindrance unto me. You are not seeing things through God's eyes, but from man's point of view. When they had the Passover supper, the twelve disciples gathered around Jesus, and he became sorrowful. He soon understood why. He told us that one of us, his closest followers, was going to betray him. We began to argue amongst ourselves over who it would be. Even I asked the question, surely it isn't I, is it, Lord? Jesus soon told us that it was Judas Iscariot. And as Judas left the room, we all breathed a sigh of relief that it wasn't us. Of course, I, I knew all along it could really be me. I was the rock, I was the brave one, I was the strong one. After we ate the bread and drank the wine, Jesus told us that we would be scattered and that he would be taken and killed. And then with great affection, he said, My children, I will only be with you for a short time. And where I am going, you cannot come. I, I said, But Lord, where are you going? And Jesus said, where I'm going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. And I began to argue with him, well, why can't I follow you now, Lord? I, I would go with you to prison. I would lay down my life for you. And Jesus looked at me and said, will you lay down your life for me, Peter? And then quietly he said, Truly, I tell you, this night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But I knew in my heart that I would never deny Jesus, the Son of God, the Son of the living God, the anointed one. I was the one he could always count on. As it became dark, we walked over to the Mount of Olives to the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus told us to stay and watch and pray while he went deeper into the garden to pray alone. We began to pray, but we were exhausted and, 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 and we soon fell asleep. And Jesus came by and woke us up and said, could you not stay awake and pray with me for one hour? And he went away again and, and I prayed. I, I prayed for a while. I tried to pray, but just like the other disciples, soon fell asleep again. Jesus came and he woke us a second time. And we were still half, half, half asleep when we heard the sound of a crowd coming. It was the religious leaders and, and soldiers, and they were being led by that traitor, Judas Iscariot. Didn't realize they were here to arrest Jesus. And I grabbed my sword and I struck Malchus, a servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Amidst all the chaos, Jesus stopped 
And he turned to me and he said, Peter, do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he would send me more than 12 legions of angels? <laughs> well, of course he was. He was the son of God. Peter, Jesus told me, Peter, put away your sword. And then he reached out and he healed the man's severed ear. And then Jesus was arrested. There was a lot of shouting and, and shoving and pushing. And, and the disciples, we were scattered just like he said. Some of the disciples ran away and hid themselves, but, but not me. I was the rock. I was, I was the one you can count on. I, I, I was the brave one. Well, not so brave. I followed from a distance as they dragged Jesus to the house of Caiaphas, the high priest. I had not come up with a plan to how to rescue him yet, but I wasn't going to leave him alone. I sat there in the courtyard where the guards were, and I waited with them, hoping to see what would happen next. Suddenly there was a, a loud shout of blasphemer, and someone being struck and slapped, and, and I, I didn't know if I should go in to object and make myself a target, or, or just wait there in the courtyard. And while I was still considering my options, a servant girl came up and said, I've seen you before. You were with Jesus the Galilean. And people started to look. And I said, you don't know what you're talking about. And I moved to the entryway. And another servant girl came up, said, came up and said, you're also one of his disciples. Talking to the people around me, and they began to, to, to look, and two of the guards stood up and started to approach me. And I said, I am not one of his disciples, I swear. The guards appeared to relax. I, I, I quickly made my way in, into the room to avoid any further questioning. And I could see Jesus on the far side of the room being interrogated. And then a man came up to me, a relative, a servant of the high priest, a relative of Malchus, whose ear I had cut off. He said, did I not see you in the garden with him? I began to argue, and another man came up and said, you're also one of his. You're a Galilean. I recognize the accent. And by now, everyone was turning to look, and to my, to my shame, I began to curse and swear. I know not this man of whom you speak. Suddenly, I heard the loud crowing of the rooster. And Jesus from across the room turned to look at me. And I remembered the words that he had said before the, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. His eyes pierced deep into my very soul. And looking at him, I could see great hurt, and yet pure love hit his eyes. <laughs> and I went out from there and wept bitterly. Wow. A uh, great presentation of the scripture, taken exactly from scripture, and I am not sure how I can get this computer thing to work, but maybe Peter will come back in and help me. <laughs> One day. One day would change the world. One day would change all of human kind. It would change the way in which we actually count time, B.C. and A.D. One day. And this Easter season, beginning on Good Friday and concluding on Sunday morning, 
It is a story that we're going to tell to the glory of the one who came to save us. This Jesus who has come is the one who is going to, to continue in his mission. His mission did not conclude at Easter with the rising of himself. His mission continues to today, recalls lost people to himself, where he lifts up brothers and sisters in Christ. Where he encourages people like Peter, who is a believer in him, but a great great fall in his life. Many different characters we're going to see in this sermon series. We saw Judas and his betrayal last week. We just saw Peter and his denial this week. Next week it is Mary, the mother of Jesus, and then Mary Magdalene, the victor, and an angel who is a proclaimer, a proclaimer of the last one that we will see on Easter Sunday morning, which is a Savior, and his name is Jesus. So we're going to look at Peter, and so if you have your scripture, Luke chapter 22 is our place of reading today. We'll begin in verse 31. We'll read 31 down to 34 and then pick up at 54 and conclude down to 62. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to have you that he may sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you and your faith and that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this morning until you deny three times that you know me. Verse 54. And they seized him, that is Jesus, and led him away, bringing him into the high priest house. And Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. And then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him said this man was also with him but he denied it saying woman I do not know him and a little later someone else said uh, saw him and said you also are one of them but Peter said man I am not And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, Certainly this man was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter and Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, a saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. You may be seated. This morning, I would like for us to look in three different directions. And I don't know. Um, three different directions. 
at three different people. Satan, Peter, and the Lord. Three main characters in this story. I mean, there are, there are people that are around him. There's guards that are around him. We saw Judas was around him last week. It all happens within a short period of time, probably about 9 o'clock in the evening until about 6 o'clock in the morning is the whole time of the, uh, of the time of Jesus' trial. Maybe a little later, because by 9 o'clock, they had led him out of the city up to a hill called Golgotha, and there they crucified him. But Jesus had said to Simon beforehand, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded of you that he might sift you like wheat. What's interesting to know in looking at this and studying this is that the word you in this first verse, in verse 31, is used twice. Satan has demanded. Some translations say Satan has asked. You do know that Satan is on God's leash. He cannot go any further than the Lord would allow him to go in Peter's life or in your life. But the word you in that is not singular. Therefore, he is not speaking just to Peter. It is plural, which means Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you, all of you. As though Peter is the representative of all the group, and that he is really. Because every time that Peter is listed among the disciples in Scripture, which is four times, he's always listed first. And by the way, Judas Iscariot was always listed last. Plural. He is wanting to sift all of you disciples who are here. He is wanting to sift you as though sifting you as wheat. It is a picture of the removing of the wheat from the shaft. It is a shaking violently. It is a picture of what is happening to Job in Job chapter 1, where Satan comes to the Lord and says, Hey, look, I'm here. And if you take your hand off of Job, then he will curse you to your face. Job was shaken violently. He lost everything in just a matter of moments. And here is a shaking that, is, that he is asking to do of them. I think Satan's work is this. He wants to do to the other 11 what he did to Judas. Judas. He said, if you just give me a moment with them where I can shake their world violently as though I'm sifting them like wheat, you will find out that the grain is not there. All you have is chaff like you have with Judas. In the verse following, in verse 32, it changes from a plural to a singular, which is odd. Because Jesus said, I have prayed for you, Peter, that your faith may not fail. And when you, singular Peter, have turned again, strengthen your brothers. I have prayed for you, Peter. Isn't it great to see that Jesus says to his disciple, the one who is in the midst of this, that is, he is told, is going to be told that he is going to fall. I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. Can I tell you that Satan still wants to wreak havoc in his disciples? He still wants to shake your world. 
He still wants to take your faith, but he cannot, as he could not in Peter's life. You see, Jesus, if he prayed for Peter, that his faith would not fail, his faith would not fail. Oh, he made a great error. He was one of Satan's targets. But Satan's target was turned around. And he would take what was happening in Peter's life and then be able to move it to a different place. But he needed to get Peter to the place, the Lord needed to get Peter to the place where he could use him. Satan thought, if I could turn all his disciples against him, that would be a crushing blow to this Jesus. But the opposite would affect would happen. He didn't get chaff when he shook them. He got wheat. The wheat came through. Point number two. Let me see. Sorry, guys, I messed it up. I tell you what, let's pray. Father, you know the hearts of everyone in here. You know that it is not with the words of a fallible man that will change anyone's life. But one word of yours will change us forever. And Lord, the desire... Uh, today is that the word would, would be hindered by all the things that are happening. I pray, Lord, that Satan would find that there is indeed a people here that loves you. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Point number two. Peter says, I never will. Hold your finger here in Luke chapter 22 and go over to Matthew chapter 26, if you would. Back two books, Matthew chapter 26. Because what we're going to see is that Peter had a lot of self-confidence. Peter had a lot of, I can, I will, I will never. He had a lot of pride. And before the Lord could use him in a remarkable way, in a time later at Pentecost, he would have to get him to the point where he would say, I can't. I need you, Lord. But let's look at verse 30, chapter 26 of Matthew. And when they, the disciples and Jesus, had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And then Jesus said to them, You will fall away because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. And Peter answered him, Though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. And Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you that this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter said to him, Even if I must die with you, I will never deny you you and all the disciples said the same thing so here they are jesus is arrested jesus goes to the courtyard where he is taken and peter and apparently from john's gospel john is with him john is admitted into the courtyard Peter is held up and is not allowed in. John's 
gospel says. And then John goes back to the, to the, uh, to the girl at the gate and she lets him in. So here it is, Peter is with him. And he does something odd. He sees the guards that had been there, probably the ones that had taken Jesus. And they make a fire and Peter goes over and joins them and sets down. He's in not the best of company right now. He sat down with them. And as the questions come, asking him if he was one of Jesus' disciples, if he was with them, if he was a part of his group, not once, not twice, but three times, Peter denied Jesus. As Chris referenced, in the Gospel of Mark, it says that the rooster crowed twice. And in the Gospel of Mark, it said that the rooster crowed the first time after the first denial. It's as if the Lord was saying, listen, listen, there's one. But Peter didn't listen. And so he denied him a second time and a third time and then the rooster crowed for the second time. The scripture in Luke chapter 22 says that Peter remembered. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter and Peter remembered the saying of the Lord. But he remembered too late. He remembered after he had sinned. And what he remembered was not the fear of this rooster crowing. He remembered the words that the Lord had spoken to him. That you are going to deny me. I can't even imagine what it would have been like for the Lord to be where he was at and turn around and see me as I have just committed the biggest mistake, the biggest error, the biggest sin of my life. The Lord turned and looked to him, the Lord's face with love, but yet sorrow, the one who had taught him about sin, the one who had come to save him from his sin, and Peter knew. You see, earlier on, when Peter had said to Jesus' question, who do men say that I am? Chris accurately said, I really don't know where that came from. Jesus tells him where it came from. It came from not him, but from on high. When he says that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And it is not three or four sentences later that Jesus said, I am going to Jerusalem. And there, I'm going to be crucified. And Peter tried to stop him. No, that's never going to happen. Peter couldn't stop Jesus' crucifixion. No one could. And aren't you glad that no one could? Here's Peter. He is so proud. He is so self-confident. He is so sure of himself. I will never. But then he did. And he was crushed in spirit. And he went away and he wept sorrowfully. Sorrowfully.
All of Peter's pride had been sifted out of him. All his confidence had been sifted out of him. All of his rashness had been sifted out of him. All of his impulsiveness in which he was ready to blurt out without thinking often, the first thought that came to his mind, it was all sifted out. And he was quiet and he wept bitterly. But Peter and his faith was not sifted out. That's where we come to point three. Jesus says, when you turn back. Notice in verse 33 of Luke 22. But I have prayed for you, Peter, singular, that your faith, Peter, may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. A momentary untruthfulness of one's deepest convictions does not wipe out those convictions. A momentary lapse in what you strongly believe in does not wipe out all that you believe in. And the greatest sin of Peter didn't wipe out his faith. Yes, he stumbled. Yes, he fell. But he didn't stay down. The difference between him and Judas Iscariot is Judas Iscariot had no hope going forward. He would be in a place where he would he would go out and sorrow, as with Simon Peter, but he had no hope. And he would go and he would find not life that would continue on, but he would find death. And he would take his own life. But Peter had one who stood by him, who said, I have prayed for you, And Jesus' prayers never are in vain. Jesus' prayer was answered just because Peter fell. He did not lie down and stay down. I want to show you the reason why Peter didn't fall. And it's found in three scriptures. And the first one is this, if you would. See, Jesus said, we are going to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man will be delivered up to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified, and he will be raised on the first day. The plan of God for salvation has never been stopped by Peter and his actions. It would never be stopped by Judas and his actions. It would never be stopped by the other ten that left him and went their way. And it won't be stopped even by what we decide here today. Ephesians chapter 1 says, The plan of God's salvation was set in place before the creation of the world. Before he made you, before he made me, before he made the world itself, or the stars in the sky and the sun and the moon, his plan of salvation was set in place. And it stands firm in the heavens today that he was going to come and to save us. Next scripture is this. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. Notice this, that the reason that Christ came and to be a savior was because he was saving us from something and that something was our sins. He was crushed for our iniquities. He was pierced for our transgressions. Chastisement that was on him brought us peace. Jesus' plan of salvation was to go to the cross and to die an innocent man for the sins of all uninnocent people. Everyone who would call upon him in salvation and in faith would be his people. 
Last scripture is this. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And Peter would never forget because you remember that Peter would later on, after Jesus had gone to the cross and after he had been laid in the tomb and after he had rose from the dead, that Peter would be the, one of the first ones to see him. And he would see him before the day was out. And he would see him again before the day was out. And he would see him a week later. And he would meet him in Galilee where Jesus said that he would meet them. And there in Galilee, beside the sea, Peter is out fishing with his disciples. And they have caught nothing all night long. And Jesus is on the shore and said, hey men, have you caught anything? And they said, no, we haven't caught anything. Thanks for asking. And Jesus says, cast your net on the other side. And when they did, they had such a catch of fish, it reminded Peter of the time in which he was called the first time by God, where he was in a boat full of fish and he bowed down in front of Jesus and said, depart from me, I'm a sinner. And so the second time this happens, Peter immediately knows who Jesus is. That is Jesus. And he takes his garment, he wraps it around himself and jumps into the water and swims to the shore before the boat gets there. I can imagine that meeting was quite awkward. But I can also imagine that Jesus was quite graceful. Peter would never forget it. How Jesus would restore him. Right on the Sea of Galilee, he would ask him three times the same question, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, you know, I love you. Peter, do you love me? You know, I love you. Peter, do you love me? You know all things, Lord. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Peter, about whom we're talking about, seems to have carried this on into his mind even as he writes his own letters later in the scripture turn if you would over to first peter towards the end of your bible because what peter would write in his letter seems to remind us a whole lot of the night in which he betrayed Jesus. And that not only did he remember that night, but he had learned from it. And not only had he learned from it, but it seems as though the Lord is speaking to him and saying, write it down so that others can be reminded of what you have gone through. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5. Second half of the verse says, Clothe yourselves, all of you, in humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, and he gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. 
your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him, the dominion and the power forever and ever. Amen. Two big points. Don't be proud, be humble. And two, be watchful. Because your enemy, Satan, is watching seeking whom he may devour. Got your finger there in 1 Peter. Turn back one page, maybe, in your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 2. First Peter 2. Peter wants to remind us in verse 24. This Jesus bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his, wound, by his wounds you have been healed. For you were like sheep straying, but now have returned to the shepherd, the overseer of your souls. By his wounds, you have been healed. I can imagine Peter felt great comfort in that. For we were like strain, you we were strain like sheep. You know, we are like sheep. They say of a shepherd that it is a shepherd will follow his sheep and lead them to the places to eat. And sometimes, though, the sheep will go close to the edge. They will climb down the edge to be able to get some more of the green grass that's there. And they're a very perilous place. And those sheep are there eating, thinking everything is great. But the shepherd knows if I jump down to help this sheep at this moment, they will probably be frightened and they will jump to their death. So what a shepherd would do in that time is the shepherd would leave the sheep on the edge until it had nothing to eat. Maybe a day, two, or even three days until it lost all of its strength. It lost all of its ability to be able to move. And then the shepherd would go down and pick up the sheep because now the sheep has no strength. The sheep now decides that it is no longer going to depend upon itself. It is no longer going to struggle away from the shepherd that is going to come. That is a picture of what Christ has done for us. Unless we come humbly before him, Peter needed to get rid of the eyes. I will never even if everybody else does, he needed to get rid of the self-confidence because self-confidence will never bring you salvation. He needed to get rid of his pride. He needed to get rid of all of that so that he could then trust only in Christ who would bend over and he would pick him up and lift him up to be able to be Peter, the apostle. He would share the greatest message at Pentecost that the church needed to hear. The salvation comes only through Jesus Christ in him alone. We're here this morning and I'm so glad that Peter points out for us that we are in great need of what Jesus is doing 
not only in our salvation, but he is doing in us today so that we don't trust in our abilities, in our giftedness, because you do know that you're, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are different than the gifts that you have. You're gifted and I'm gifted in some certain things, but the gifts of the Holy Spirit are different than that. And he wants us to lay down our gifts. He wants us to be humble before a holy God and to call upon him. Will you bow your heads with me? Lord, we're here today because one man by the name of Peter fell when he thought he never would. He thought that, Lord, he was the rock. But what I learned this week, that there is only one time in Scripture that Jesus spoke to him with the name Peter. And that was in the 34th verse that we read about Peter. When you have returned, strengthen your brothers. Every other time, Jesus mentions speaks to this man, he always used Simon. Because I believe that Simon always acted like Simon. And it was not until he would return and he would begin to strengthen his brothers after he has been restored that he would indeed be a rock. So Lord, we're here today just asking, Lord, that you would humbly bring to us whatever it is that you want for us. Father, speak into us, I pray. Allow us to know, Lord, what you would have. Father, let us lay down our pride. Let us lay down our abilities and say, Lord, I need you. I can't do this alone. Maybe there's someone here that does not know you, and today would be the day of salvation. They know that, that they are sinners separate from a holy God. And today they've come to put their faith in Jesus Christ and believe on him as the only way of salvation. They believe he died for their sins and he rose from the grave. And today would be the day of their salvation, that they would commit to him their very life, and that, Lord, they would find a joy and an eternal purpose in you and in you alone. Father, I thank you. In the time of singing, may you bring glory to yourself. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand? Try
Pastor, I have one. So the other day, I woke up with a start, realizing that Jenny and I have been saving for months for Slink's birthday gift, and I didn't know when Slink's birthday was. So the Secrets class is going to remedy this, or try to remedy this, by uh, partnering with Instant Church Directory. If you see the slides on the screen, you'll see a little bit about this organization. It'll have everything accessible on your phones or on the website. We can print out a, di a directory, uh, a physical copy of it. If needed, our plan right now is to do, a f do photos, family photos, for this directory on Easter Sunday when everyone's dressed their best. <laughs> That's in four weeks, by the way, so dress your best in four weeks. <laughs> I will bring my camera and other equipment to do that. Um, more info to come on this. Um, with links and information and and everything. I am the point of contact for this. So just wanted to make everyone aware that this is coming. And I think it's a good gonna be a good thing to help us connect. Right. We have 33. 33. Wow. 
Our speakers was frankly really the help of um, <laughs> But our speakers are excited, so um, they've been praying over each one of the ladies, as well as they've been praying over them. So, all right, great. This week, uh, Yes, there's a sign up sheet in the back uh, for the men's meeting that we're going to have Sunday, March 25th. So, anyone that hasn't signed up, please do. Thank you. 